Welcome again to the Key West Lou Legal Hour. I am Louis Patron. The reason I go through all these names every week, by the way, of these different places is not to impress you, but I have people in 35 to 40 different countries watching this show at this moment, either via computer, I'm sorry, via computer, the internet, or television. And I want everyone to know this is worldwide. We're talking to everybody. It's like one big happy family. Now, we had a crazy week. Every week's a crazy week. We have a crazy Congress in this country. We have an Italian election going on. We have stupid things, sad things happening all over the world. I'm going to start with something that impacted me yesterday when I was reading it. Time magazine comes out every week. It's a weekly with a cover, Time magazine. And they do a major article every week. And this week's article was entitled, Bitter Pill, Bitter Pill, Why Medical Bills Are Killing Me. Bitter Pill, Why Medical uh, Bills Are Killing Me. Uh, it came out February 20th, two or three days ago. It was written by Stephen Brill. Brill is a great investigative reporter. I, I saw an article he did 25, 30 years ago on the legal profession. It was an eye-opener for me. This man knows where it's at. He digs and he's accurate. Uh, here's what he's got to say, and we know this already, that the medical bills are killing this country. Hospital bills, doctor bills. It seems when you go to the hospital, you know, they, they can charge whatever they want. They give you an itemized bill. Who understands those several pages of this and that? You can't understand what their codes mean. And so he took a look into it in depth. Uh, it's also a significant amount of our spending in this country. I think 20% of the money that the American people spend goes for medical services. That's a lot of money. Now, we know we're getting ripped off as a people with the, the bills at the drugstore, the pharmaceutical bills. Can't be this drug costs $400, this one $200. If you got insurance, you get it for $60 or $70, a 30-day supply. Who are they kidding? And when you go to the hospital, everything is so expensive. So he took a look at it. And here's some, you must read this article. Time Magazine, Stephen Brill. It's long. It's 18 pages. Unusually long article. Eye-opener, specifics. Read it. You will enjoy it. Examples of what he's talking about. There is a generic pill for Tylenol. I can't pronounce its name, so I can't give it to you, all right? It's a big name, beginning with an A, but it's a generic. The hospital charges you $1.50 per pill. It's a generic for Tylenol. We all take Tylenol to kill our headaches sometimes. $1.50 a pill. You can buy the same generic over Amazon for $1.50 for a bottle of 100 a bottle of 100 for $1.50 or in the hospital, one pill for a dollar. That means that the hospital is making $150 gross on one bottle of Tylenol generic. And they're not paying a dollar forty-nine. They're probably paying a buck or a buck and a quarter because they buy so much. That's ridiculous profit. I mean, that's tremendous profit. They charge you for everything in the hospital. You don't know how bad it is. Do you know that the ink in the pen, in the ballpoint pen, that the nurse and the doctors use when they're filling out your chart, you know, they gotta go sit behind a desk in the hallway and they're writing down what's wrong with you today. You get charged, you and I get charged for the ink in the pen that is used. They have figured out a system and they know that a doctor's report and a nurse's report takes so much ink. You pay for that ink. It's on your bill. If you go in for a, uh, they, got, they got to take blood. You know, you go in the hospital, they take your blood. You know it costs $36 to put that thing in your vein? $36. And if you're going to be there a few days, they put something in and leave it so they don't have to go through your skin anymore. They just go boom uh, through the tubing itself. Still charged. $36. That $36 does not include any medicines they're shooting into your body or any drugs. That's extra. It's assumed that a shot costs anywhere from $250 to $400 when you get a shot of something in the hospital. Now, 
The United States, so says the Stephen Brill in this article, spends more money than any other country in the industrial world for medical services. In fact, if you take the 10 co countries, England, France, Italy, that follow us in the amount of medical we spent, money we spend for medical every year, the United States spends more than the first 10 countries combined. You take England, France, Italy, Greece, put them all together into one package. The next 10 industrial countries after ours, because we're the most expensive, we still spend more than those 10 countries. Why? I mean, the, our medical care is supposed to be terrific, but, but for certain things, I'll tell you, it isn't so good. You can get it better and cheaper or as good and cheaper in another country. Which brings me to this. <laughs> we hear about Medicare all the time. <clears throat> Excuse me, Medicare. The Republicans want to cut Medicare. Uh, I don't know why. I'm going to tell you what I'm thinking. I'm on Medicare. I'm 77 years old. I think Medicare is the greatest thing that ever came down. The Obama plan should have given everyone Medicare. It pays 80% of your bill. You struggle for the other 20 or you buy a supplemental plan that is not expensive to cover it. Medicare pays your bills easily. Now, here's the way it works. The hospital charges any percentage of profit. The doctors charge any percentage of profit they want for a service if you are under the age of 65. Once you reach 65 and you're on Medicare, the government says you can only charge 6% above what it costs you. Your profit factor is only 6%, whereas it may be 400 or 600 or 1,000 percent normally in a hospital or with a doctor, the government controls the costs of Medicare. 6% is the max. Example, an operation, and this is the way Brill puts it, if you're, you have the bad luck of getting sick two months before you're going to be 65, you have to have immediate surgery, it may cost you $35,000. That same surgery, if you're 65 years old, two months later costs you $600 to $800. 35,000 to 600 or 800. See, do you see the difference? In fact, the Stephen Brill suggests rather than raise the age for Medicaid, we should lower it three to five years because we're getting a better deal for our buck, a better bang for our buck with people on Medicare because of the 6% rule, which the doctors and hospitals follow, which the government enforces. We'd save money. And with Obamacare, more people are going to have medical care. He says the way to go is to drop the age limit, not increase it. Great article. You must read it. Time magazine this week about increased medical costs. I recommend it to you highly. Moving on. We live in Key West here. Key West, Key West. Nothing dramatic happens in Key West. We're the southernmost community in the United States. It's warm here generally. Uh, it's a great place to live. We're all very laid back. No one dresses. You're always in shorts, a t-shirt. I'm dressing for the show with a long sleeve shirt. It's a nice place to live. Nothing dramatic happens here. You come, you have a quiet week or two laid back. It's, it's not hell raising as most people think, though we have bars that do that. Something happened last week that was very exciting Someone here won the lottery. No one's ever won the lottery big time. The Florida lottery last week was $17 million. Someone bought a ticket at Publix, our supermarket. We only have two supermarkets in town. They bought a ticket at Publix that turns out to be the winner. $17 million. God bless America. I think that's terrific. It's a life changer. I can't wait, nor can anyone else, to find out who it was. Stay with me, folks. I'll be back. Louis Patron back with the Key West Lou Legal Hour. Thank you again for joining me today. I want to tell you some other shows that I'm doing also that you might be interested in. I am doing a blog talk radio show. What's a blog talk radio show? You listen to it off the internet. You don't see me, you don't see anything but words on a screen, uh, and not the words I'm saying. It just tells you what you got to do to listen to me. But I'm doing that show now. I, I was doing it 
Tuesday mornings at 7. No one wanted to listen at 7 because they didn't want to get up. But, but I switched it to 9 o'clock Tuesday night, 9 o'clock Tuesday night, half hour talk show. People call in, uh, and 9 o'clock's better. I, I had 500% more people in the evening than I had in the morning, and I hope that figure increases. It's called Tuesday Talk with Key West Lou. I, I use the name Key West Lou for everything I do. Tuesday Talk with Key West Lou. Uh, easy to find. Just type in uh, radio talk show, Key West Lou talk show, Key West Lou blog talk show, and it comes up. Okay. There was a report put out by Forbes magazine last week. Now, Forbes is a major magazine in this country, a major publication. It's the guru of finances. It, it talks about money at the highest levels, the lowest levels. It knows. Its people know what's going on with the economics of this country and the economics of this world. Huffington Post picked up on one of Forbes' articles and reprinted it uh, a day or two later. I found this in Huffington Post. They said, uh, this, this Forbes article says, that there are four communities in the United States, four communities, where women earn more than men. Women earn more money than men. Only four communities in the United States. That is a sad comment. But putting that aside, do you know what one or who one of those communities is? Key West, Florida, my friends, in Key, yes, you heard me, in Key West, Florida, women earn more money than men. It struck me. I don't understand it, but as I think about it, women ha seem to have better jobs here in town. They're running all the, the, the not-for-profits. They're running uh, all kinds of bit, small businesses, and they're out in the forefront. Whatever the reason, if you're a woman you want to make more money, than a man. Come live with us in Key West. Two years ago, I did a, a story or sort of an expose uh, on the show, on TV, internet show. I was at another station at the time. But what I talked about was the cost of debt. And the only place in the world, my friends, where it costs a lot of money to die, to be buried, is the United States. Uh, you get buried cheaper everywhere else in the world. And one of the cost factors in the United States is that we embalm the bodies of our dead. You know, cut them open, take everything out, and so forth. And that's an expensive factor. Turns out, no other country embalms. Occasionally, one will do it but no other country embalms as we do. I thought at the time it was the law you had to be embalmed. No such law in this country. If you said you didn't want the body embalmed, you'll still lay in that box for three days, you know, being shown. If That's the way it goes. You don't need embalming. Another reason why no embalming became helpful or is helpful, many people who are assumed to have died are not dead. What do I mean? There is the story uh, of a woman. Uh, she died. She was declared dead at the hospital. The next day, they're showing her. This was in Indonesia, I think. They're showing her a funeral service. The casket's open, and she sits up and starts talking to people. She was alive. She wasn't dead. And she had been medically declared dead. There was another story of a baby, baby, declared dead by the hospital. The baby's, the baby's sitting in the funeral parlor at night, waiting to be shown the next day. The undertaker hears crying. He goes in. It's the baby. The baby was alive. Let me tell you about something that happened this week in the United States. 20-year-old woman, I would call her a girl, but she's a 20-year-old woman. She is pregnant. She is not married. Uh, her mother doesn't know. She lives with her mother, but her mother doesn't know she's pregnant. The girl's covered it well. Now it's getting time to have the baby. She has cramps. And she says, Ma, here's what happened. She tells her mother the story. These are poor people. It was a snowstorm. They could not 
they didn't have a car to get to the hospital. The hospital wasn't that far away. They opted to walk in a snowstorm to the hospital. The temperature was three degrees below zero. Three degrees below zero. This girl's cramping. On the way to the hospital, she had to lay down. She had the baby on a sidewalk between her home and her hospital, three degrees below zero. Uh, 911's called. Ambulance come. Ambulance personnel, the emergency responders, work on the baby. They try to resuscitate the baby. They think the baby's dead, but they leave it to the hospital. They rush the baby to an emergency room. The emergency room doctors look at the baby, try to resuscitate her, can't. The baby's dead. The baby's dead. <laughs> and so it was, and it was very sad, especially the way it happened. Now, in this particular state, and I'm not sure what state it is. I apologize for not having recalled that. They, uh, they have a rule when someone's dead in the hospital that's brought in with an emergency vehicle, the police must stand watch over the body till the body is removed from the room where it purports to have died. So two police officers, two cops, are standing waiting for the baby's, baby's body to be removed. They were standing there 90 minutes. The body was covered with a sheet. All of a sudden, one of the police officers sees movement under the sheet. You got it. The baby was alive. The baby was alive. The, the ambulance people, dead. The doctors in the emergency room, dead. The hospital can't explain it. They're still trying to explain it. And I'm just sharing with you a wonderful thing that happened this week where we had a newborn declared dead that wasn't dead. This baby was alive. I hope this child has a good life. It's got to be a good luck person to have survived what I have just shared with you. Facebook. I admire Facebook. I mean, I saw that movie, I forget the name of it, uh, that shows you how allegedly Facebook got started. The kid was at Harvard, I think. He did one year, two years of school. He invented Facebook. But all the calamities this guy has faced over uh, the several years he's owned like Facebook. Besides becoming one of the richest men in the world, uh, he's had a lot of problems. He's got another one. A 104-year-old woman, she, her name's Marguerite Joseph. Marguerite Joseph, 104 years, born in 1908. She's on Facebook. She likes to read her emails and send messages out. Problem is, when you go to put, when she goes to put her age in, 104 years old to be proud of, born 1908, the program only goes to 1928. You've got to, be, if you're over 88 years old, Facebook cannot record you accurately. I think that's very interesting that with all they can do, they can't do that or they haven't done it. Facebook has not commented on this situation at all. We're going to break. Stay with me. I will return. Louis Patron back with the Key West Lou Legal Hour. I want to tell you about something else I do. I want to share these things I do with you. Perhaps you'll want to read or listen to, to some of the other things. I do a blog every morning. Uh, when I get out of bed, I, it's called Key West Lou. To find the blog, all you got to do is enter into your computer, keywestlou.com. It comes up. And I, I've been doing it for seven years. When I retired and came down to Key West full time, I was bored. I had nothing to do. So I started writing a blog. And everything you see, the radio, the television show, the articles I write for newspapers, all come from that blog I started seven years ago. I think it's boring, the blog. I think it's mundane. I only tell people what my life was in Key West the day before. Uh, like last night, I went to see The Wizard of Oz. It was a high school play. But they needed munchkins, those little people. And my grandchildren, Robert and Allie, seven and eight, were munchkins. So I went to see them in the play. And of course, I was a proud grandfather. It was terrific. But that's what the blog does. And the other thing is, over the years, remember I started it seven years ago, my, my base of readership has grown. The blog is seen in about 40, is read rather, in about 40 countries every day. There are statistics on this stuff. You can trace anything. It's read in 40 different countries by I don't know how many hundreds of people or thousands. I am absolutely impressed 
and I thank everybody for reading it. And I, I'd like you to read it because I, you might enjoy it. It's not like this. This is heavier stuff. What I write in the blog is, you know, just BS stuff. It's whatever happened to me. Uh, you know, I, I went to the coffee house. I, I saw Diane. I talked to her. You, you get to meet Key West people. I went to the chart room. Emily was bartending. And you get to know these people. So if you ever visit here, you want to go to the chart room. You want to go to the coffee house. You want to meet Emily. You want to meet Diane. Okay, moving on. This week in the news has been a furor on an issue I do not understand. China. They've discovered that China is hacking in to the computers of our major corporations. This is called cyber theft and is stealing. They are stealing the Chinese our trade secrets, our how to do from our leading manufacturers, leading industries. I don't know why the fear. China's been stealing from us and everyone else for the last 50 years. That's how China, besides having all those people, became an industrial giant. They went out and stole everybody else's thought process. The Americans, the English, the French, the Italians. They stole everybody's thought process. If they found something, they could do it better. They could do it better. I mean, you see these t-shirts they sell on the streets here in Key West? They pay 50 cents for a dollar for them. They sell them to the tourists for 15, 20 dollars because the Chinese can make them for 50 cents or a dollar. I had this terrific set of spoons, uh, silverware rather, and it was for real silverware. And someone who goes to China frequently says, gee, this is nice. I'd like to have a set like this. I says, well, here's where I got it. This is what it costs. He says, no, give me a fork. Give me one of your forks. I'll return it to you. I'm going to China next week. I'll show them this fork. They'll make it, and I'll get it for about 10% of what you paid for it. So the Chinese are smart. They're brilliant people. And I don't know why we're getting upset because they're stealing our trade secrets. Now that I read about, we all knew this. I knew this all the time, so everyone else must. I find out, though, that Russia and India are doing the same thing. Uh, I'm surprised the Russians are because I don't see them quite as industrially great as the United States or China. But India, India's come a long way in the last 20 years, my friends. They are a computer power, India. And we all know this. They're an economic giant now also, and uh, they're stealing our trade secrets. I can't believe that some of our people here are not stealing theirs. I think that's how the game is played. But again, I do not understand why everyone's getting excited about something China's been doing for the last 50 years. I have been talking for the last five or six weeks about the python hunt. Python, you know, those snakes that are 7 to 17 feet long, they're big snakes, and they don't necessarily eat you, they wrap themselves around your body, they crush you, then they swallow you whole, it takes them several days to digest you. They are not supposed to be, they don't eat humans, I, I've read, they're not, humans are not edible, I guess, they do, they do eat like deer. One of them was cut open in a 75-pound deer hole, hadn't been digested yet, was found in the python. Anyhow, we have a python problem in Florida, especially in the Everglades. Um, I won't go into how they came. I've been talking about it for six weeks now. But they're there, tens of thousands, in excess of 150,000 is the number. In excess of 150,000 pythons. And they're moving. They're in Key Largo now. We found one two months ago at our Key West airport in the grass. We don't know if it came down or someone dumped it there. But they're moving into the Keys. They definitely have been in Key Largo. What happens is these things get out there and the males and the females propagate. They have sex and they have babies and they keep having babies. They're like bunny rabbits. They keep having babies, and so now we got so many we don't know how to control them. This government in Florida, the federal government will also tell you, we don't know how to get rid of these pythons. And they are a danger, because they're eating up all the bushes, all the shrubbery, and all the little animals that are necessary to keep our ecosystem going. So the state of Florida, its wildlife commission or something, and its divine wisdom decides a couple of months ago, that they're going to have what they call a 
Python challenge. And for four weeks, people are going to be given permits who want them, and they can go out and hunt pythons. And whoever catches the most or gets the biggest will get a dollar prize. Nothing much, $1,500, $1,000. Well, it turns out 1,600 people got permits. 1,600 people got permits. The, the, the four-week permitted season ended last week. Do you know how many pythons those 1,600 people caught? Out of 150,000 pythons in the Everglades, they caught 68 pythons. 68 pythons. Now, the wildlife experts say this is terrific. I've been saying for four or five weeks, and I'm surprised this didn't happen, and I'm glad it didn't happen, that one of these idiots out there hunting is going to shoot one of his friends or someone else that's hunting. Someone's going to get hurt. This is nuts. You got a thousand people, 1,600 people wandering around looking for pythons. They're either going to shoot them in the head or they're going to chop their head off. That's how they kill them. Someone's got to get hurt. Fortunately, I was wrong. No one got hurt. But why did the experts say this is terrific? Because they didn't know how many they were going to catch, and 68 is a big number. Now, some were brought in alive. They killed them. Okay? Three they did not kill. The wildlife people did not kill three of the pythons. Three male pythons. They put two transmitters. They implanted two transmitters in each python. The reason being that one transmitter could break down and they wanted to be safe, sure, and secure, so they put a second one in. And the whole purpose is, and they released these pythons back into the wild so they could follow them because this is python breeding season. You heard me, breeding season. The female pythons give off an odor which attracts the males because they're in heat. They want to have sex. And the males go find the females. They have the sex. Now the females got the eggs. They had to carry them for a period of time. I don't know how long. And then we have more pythons being born. And the wildlife people here in the state of Florida figure those three pythons that got the transmitters, they're going to find the females who want to have sex, who are admitting this, whatever it is, to attract the males to them. Then they will know, they will know, the wildlife people, where the female python is with the eggs and can go out and kill her. And they're hoping this will help relieve the 150,000 plus python population we have. I don't know. But I got a feeling the state of Florida is spending a lot of money on this, which they should, because it's a problem out of control. But I, I hope this works. It sounds like we're, we're doing petty things to achieve a big result. Let me talk to you about this day in history. There's only one important thing that happened on this day in history. On February 22nd, I'm going to go to 1879. Do you remember what a Woolworth store was? Woolworths, five and dime store, Woolworths. Everyone used to go to department store, Woolworths. And the reason I bring this up to you is because the first Woolworth in 1879 on this date opened in my hometown of Utica, New York. Now we're going to break. When we return from break, I'm going to tell you more about this Woolworth store the Woolworth chain, how it made a lot of people rich, no longer in business, and so forth. So stay with me, my friends. As soon as I return, I will continue with this story. Louis Patron back with the Key West Lou Legal Hour again. Thank you so much for joining me this morning. When we went to break, I was talking about the first Woolworth store in the United States, Woolworth. Now, I'm old. I'm 77. Uh, I remember Woolworths. We had a Woolworths in Utica, New York uh, when I was a kid. I still re they had the first escalator in town. I remember that distinctly. We used to ride up and down the escalators. But uh, the first Woolworth department store, or first Woolworth store, I won't call it a department store, was opened by Frank Woolworth on this day, February 22nd, in 1879 in Utica, New York. It was a different concept for marketing dry goods, so to speak, to the public. Prior to Woolworths, people used to come in to buy, and there were a lot of salesmen. 
and there was no specific price. You haggled your price. You negotiated, like you do in some Mideastern countries now. You negotiate the price of the item you wanted to purchase. So they needed a lot of help. Uh, Woolworth said, no, I'm going to do this differently. I'm going to open a discount store. We think discount stores are new in some regards. He opened one in 1879. No one had thought about it before his time. And he opened one in Utica. It's a discount store. People come in. I'm going to have stuff sitting there. It's going to be behind glass where I can, but things are going to be sitting there with a price on it. It's going to be a cheaper price than they normally would get anywhere else. And if they want it, they'll buy it. I don't need that much help and so forth. He thought this was going to be terrific, and he had invented a gold mine. Unfortunately, the store in Utica failed. It was only open about three weeks. He saw it wasn't working, okay? So he closed it, waited a little while, opened another one in, not in Utica. We subsequently had one around 1920 come in again. But he opened another one in 1879 in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Lancaster, Pennsylvania. That Woolworth took off. And from that came thousands of Woolworths, not just in the United States, all over the world. It was like a McDonald's. The United States, France, Greece, China. Everyone had a Woolworths. And Woolworths was making a lot of money. Nothing expensive. This was five and dime. It was, a, it was called Woolworths five and dime. Nickel and dime. Nick, nickel and dime store. Things were cheap but went out of popularity. Finally, in June of 1997, they closed their last McDonald's. They had a few stores left. They reopened them by a store you may be familiar with, Foot Locker. They reopened the Woolworths as Foot Locker. It's had a degree of success, but nothing as Woolworths was in its heyday. It's a part of American history. Let's talk about sequestration. I love our elected representatives in Washington, especially the Republicans, though I think uh, let he who is without sin cast the first stone, uh, a plague on both your houses. I think the Republicans and the Democrats are both wrong in the way things have been done over the last 10 years. Uh, I don't think our elected officials rep necessarily represent the people they were supposed to represent anymore. I think they have selfish interests. I think they're more interested in lobbyists who can get them contributions for the next election, uh, people who can get them free trips to conferences all over the world, and things like that. But who worries about you and me and everybody else of the 330 million people living in this country? Now, we know they can't get along on this budget thing. I, I honestly believe the Republicans are being a pain in the butt. They've been a pain in the butt with uh, our good President Obama, and I'm a, an Obama supporter, ever since he got into office on these budgets. Finally, we're, we, we're going to cut back. We, we're going to save the country. We're going to save Medicare. We're going to save everything. We're going to cut back. And they couldn't cut back sufficiently in, what, what was it, 2011? So they made a deal. It was suggested by Obama, as they say, but the Democrats and Republicans, Boehner and his group, all sat down together and said, if we don't agree on further cuts in this amount by this date, and the date is March 1st next week, then there's going to be an automatic cut of something like $4 billion or $1 trillion, I don't know, because all these numbers are beyond me. This is, I don't comprehend a lot of this stuff. But they were going to cut something drastically, and the whole intent was what they're going to cut drastically would force both sides to sit down and come to an accommodation to negotiate a reasonable budget or cut in whatever they wanted to cut. Well, we got less than a week to go. <laughs> March 1st is when? Monday, Saturday, I don't know. But we've got, uh, we got less than a week to go. They haven't gotten together. Uh, the, the Republicans aren't talking to the president. The president isn't talking to the Republicans. Uh, they don't want, the Republicans especially say it's the president's fault, it was his idea in the first place, and whatever happens, happens. Well, initially I thought, so they knock, what, $4 billion or $4 trillion off the, the deficit? This is nice. 
And there's going to be a little pain and suffering. I didn't realize it might be as big as, be, as being projected now. And that may be a good way of doing it, too. Then we don't have to hear about this garbage for another 10 years that we got to cut the deficit. I'm sick and tired of hearing about it. I want to hear about jobs, the growing of industry in this country, not this every 30 days. Are we going to be on a cliff? Are we going to close down? And so forth. Now I'm seeing that this, it's called sequestration, as you all know. Sequestration can be a bad thing. I read yesterday that in the state of Texas, a red state, a Republican state, 90,000 federal employees will be laid off immediately. Not furloughed, where they work four days instead of five days a week for several months. They're going to be laid off in mass, 90,000. I don't know if it's true or not. We'll see. But this is going to happen all over the country. Well, our credit's going to go down the tubes. We already had our, our credit our our interest rate raised once. We're going to have it raised some more by these agencies who do that sort of thing. And because nobody's talking, it's a blame game. And I blame mostly the Republicans at this end. I'm sorry, if you don't agree with me, that's life. I think Boehner doesn't have the testicles to do his job. He's Speaker of the House, but he's got a problem. He's got 67 Tea Party people, and they're obstinate. They go their way, they don't care close down the government, whatever you got to do, but we want to achieve our ends. So he can't control his own party. That's precisely what's happening. So nothing is happening. I'm concerned now. I finally have come around. I am concerned with what is going to happen. Nobody's talking about what they're going to do today to solve this problem in the next week. They haven't gotten together yet. I hope they get together before midnight on the last day. No way to run a country. I couldn't have run my law practice that way. You people can't run your homes, your lives that way, or if you've got a business, your business that way. Okay. I told you about the fella, or not the fella, I don't know, somebody won a $17 million uh, lottery here in Key West. I told you in an earlier segment. Big deal. Uh, people acquire money in different ways. Someone's won the lottery, $17 million. God bless. Love it. Some people steal. There was a robbery this past Monday at the Brussels International Airport. The way it was a $50 million diamond theft. $50 million in diamonds were stolen. It's the way they were stolen. It's the thing that movies are made of. What happened is this. There was a plane. Passenger plane, but it carries cargo. The diamonds had to go from Brussels to someplace else. They were in packages, like big mailing packages or FedEx. These weren't FedEx packages, though. And there were 120 of them full of cut diamonds. And they were loaded onto the plane, you know, where they put the luggage in on the underside. The passengers are on the plane. The doors are shut on the plane. They're pushing, they put the luggage in and these diamonds. Uh, they sealed up, and while they're standing there, there were two cars that had, there's a big metal fence, cable fence of some sort, around the airport. It goes for miles. Well, there were two police cars on one side, the opposite side of the fence, not inside, with four policemen in each one wearing these big white masks like football helmets with a front on them. And at a particular time, they cut a hole in the fence drove their cars through, drove up to the airplane, pulled out their guns, told the guys who had just sealed, closed the door with the diamonds inside with the luggage, open the door, open the door, they knew exactly where to go, what they were looking for, took the 50, the uh, whatever the number was I told you, bags of diamonds out, put them in their car and drove off. This whole robbery, took two minutes and 90 seconds. Isn't that amazing? $50 million, two minutes and 90 seconds. Now, some people, this is terrible. I think it's wrong. You can't steal. But some people are going to say, God bless these guys. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Obviously had to have inside information. But it's, it's going to be the theft of the century, this early part of our new century here. And I wonder if anyone will ever catch these people. They'll go out and sell those diamonds, $50 million worth of cut diamonds. They'll sell those diamonds maybe for 
30 or 40 cents in the dollar. So what? They just picked up, what, 15, 20 million dollars to split eight ways. Not a bad deal. I want to talk about the Pope. Pope Benedict XVI, who has announced his retirement at the end of this month, on the 28th of February. I'm a Catholic. So I, I, I know a bit about that of which I speak. I've been a Catholic my whole life. I am not a good Catholic. I'm a, what's called a fallen away Catholic, though I went to Catholic grammar school, high school, and college. I've done it all except study for the priesthood. When the Pope announced that he was retiring and retiring in three weeks, I thought it was too quick because Popes, number one, don't retire. The last one that retired was sometime in 1200 because we had a schism and there were two sets of priests who had each had a pope, so we had two popes. They got together and they had to get rid of one of the popes. He resigned. But we've never had a pope resign otherwise. They get old, they get decrepit, they're on canes, they can't walk, they're in bed all the time, but they remain pope till God takes them, till they die. Well, this pope's going to get out in 30 days. Now, and then the cardinals have to go and vote on a new pope. Now there's been word this week that maybe they can accelerate the process of getting a new pope. They won't have to wait six weeks. They can do it in maybe three weeks. Uh, they'll have to change the, the, the laws, the canon laws of the church. I don't know if it's going to happen. All this to me, to me, seems like too much too soon. And I'm going to tell you why when I return from this station break. Stay with me. Patron back with the final segment of today's Key West Lou Legal Hour. Thank you again for joining me. Uh, I was talking about Pope Benedict, who announced his resignation, what, two weeks ago? Uh, effective the end of this month, which is in the next few days. And I thought this was awful strange, as I've already explained, because popes don't resign. Uh, no matter how decrepit and old they are, they do not resign. And the other thing is now they want to accelerate the election of the new pope, and they have to change canon law to do that, and they're thinking seriously of doing it. Why? And I just say, maybe it's my cynical legal training, uh, or maybe I'm just a cynic at heart, but I question why the rush? Why is everything being done so rapidly? So I take a look at this. The church has a lot of problems. Things are not smooth in the Catholic Church. I'm not telling you something you don't know. You may not know as much as I'm going to share with you, but things haven't been good, and there has been chaos the past few years in the Vatican and Rome. What are their problems? They got the sex abuse scandal worldwide. It was only in the United States 30 years ago. Ten years ago, it hit Italy. It became obvious ten years ago. These things come out over a period of time. In the last 10 years since the sex scandal came out, the pedophilia, 90% of Catholics no longer go to church in Italy, the home of Catholicism, the home of the Vatican. The churches are more empty than they are in the United States. We've only gone down from 100% uh, to one-third, 30, 33% we've got left. They've got less than 10% left going to church in Italy, a problem. Uh, there have been some communication screw up. You know, they got television stations, radio stations, the, 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 the Vatican. They're not poor, and they spread the word there and all over the world, the word of God or whatever they want to say. Well, they recently, I don't know what they said, but whatever they said irritated the Jews and the Muslims. They were insulted. And this is still an ongoing problem, putting it to rest. Then you have the situation where the, you know, the Pope, he's a big man, he's like a king. And he's better taken care of, I think, than the President of the United States. He has his own private butler who lays out his clothes, etc. Well, his butler stole papers from his desk in, a, in his bedroom, stole personal papers from the Pope. And we all know about this, this was about a year ago, he was arrested. Uh, he was tried, he was convicted, he went to jail, then the Pope went to see him and said, I bless you and I forgive you, and he was released from jail. Now we have the Vatican Bank. The Vatican Bank has been in trouble for about the last three years. 
there is a belief that the Vatican Bank is being used to, uh, what do you call it, clean money, wash money, I forget the, the term, I've got a mental block. Uh, but they're, they're putting bad money through the bank and taking it out clean. They're laundering, they're laundering money, I forget sometimes. They're laundering money. And big investigation from outside the Vatican, uh, the prosecutors in Italy, the, the Rome prosecutors. Uh, in fact, they attached last year one of the Vatican's bank accounts containing $20 million, saying they were bad proceeds from some illegitimate deal. This is pressing on the papacy. We have many fallen away Catholics in my church, as I am. I just don't go to church anymore. They're I, my own reasons, but they probably everyone has the same reason. And the church is making no efforts to reconcile with those that are fallen away, such as myself, to bring them back into the fold. That's another problem. Recent news articles have indicated, and this is before the Pope declared that he was going to retire, have indicated that the papacy, the Vatican, which runs the whole Catholic Church worldwide, is disorganized. Nobody knows what's going on. Everything's screwed up. It's the only way I can put it. This is a problem. Now, the church was always into third world countries, the Catholic Church, because they were going to take the blacks in Africa. They were going to take the Indians back in the 1600s in America, and they were going to convert them to Catholicism from paganism, and this would add to the church's ranks and probably cash flow and everything else, but they were going to save their souls. And this was their territory to work in and be successful in. Now they're not that successful. And the reason they're not successful is because there's an evangelical Pentecostal movement in this world. Evangelical Pentecostal movement. Some of them talk to God, you know, and they, they, then they, they do this, they get up, and God's in their body, the Holy Ghost, and they go like this. Uh, Christ comes down and talks to them in, in tongues, and all of a sudden they can speak a language they never spoke before. I don't buy any of this. You have to excuse me. It may be correct. It may be true. I don't know. I don't believe it. But anyhow, those groups are doing better than the Catholics in the third world countries in converting people. All right? And then, and this shocked me, there is an increasing number of people who do not believe in God. Because I still believe in God, though I don't go to church. There is an increasing number of people who do not believe in God, and this is affecting the operation of the church. So all in all, the church has got a lot of problems. We probably need it. It's like getting a new president. You need a change. You need somebody new in office. And it's probably good we're going to have a new pope. But the way this fellow, Pope Benedict XVI, and I say this with well, all due respect for him, is going out, is strange. Okay, let's go to Italy. Italy. Italy is having their election in one on Sunday. Sunday's the national election. Is Monty who has been sucking up to the Germans and increasing the taxes on his Italian people, going to continue in office as prime minister, or is Berlusconi going to come back? Okay. Everyone initially thought Berlusconi was going to come back because he's a smart politician. He wrote a letter to his people two weeks ago, to everyone in Italy, mass mailing, and he said, see, in Italy, real estate taxes have been tripled in the last two years. He said, I'm going to give you back all the money on your increased real property taxes. Man, smart. So it was thought he was going to win. All of a sudden, though, because it's a coalition government, the series of parties, the Communist Party, which is a big party in Italy, came out in support of Monty. So now they think Monty's going to win. The, people bet on this. In Las Vegas, they're betting on this. In England, they're betting. In London, they're betting on it. And they think now that Monty's the winner and Berlusconi's the, Berlusconi's the loser. We shall see. My showtime is over. Thank you for joining me this week. See you next week.